In this video we're going to introduce what's called the imaginary unit and start our way on looking at complex numbers. So just as way of an overview, so far we've always ignored situations where we've got a square root of a negative number, something like the square root of minus 1 or square root of minus a or anything like that really. So we've ignored those things and said they don't work in the real world. Well in the real world meaning real number world that's quite true. But what we're going to do now is develop a way or introduce a way such that we can deal with those kind of numbers. Because it actually turns out they're kind of useful in uh, various applications that we'll see more of later. So the first thing we're going to do is introduce this idea of the imaginary unit and then some rules for arithmetic on how to work with it. And you'll find that actually the rules aren't all that different from the ones you already know for adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing. So this is a couple of little tweaks that get added in along the way. So first of all, let's just have a motivating problem. We've got a fairly simple looking problem here, x squared plus 1 equals 0. Think about how you might solve that. Remember solving an equation, the first thing you want to try to do is isolate x. So what I'd normally do is try to subtract 1 from both sides to get rid of that 1. I'd end up with x squared equals minus 1. Then I need to get the square away, so I'd probably take the square root of both sides. So I'd say x is equal to the square root of minus 1. Plus or minus, just to be exact. But then I think, well, actually, wait a minute. I can't do that because I can't take the square root of a minus number. Um, square roots only work on positives and zero. But what we can do is introduce what's called the imaginary unit, I. It's got the symbol I. Sometimes in, um, I think it's in electrical engineering, it's often uses the symbol J because I is used for, uh, for current uh, of values. But anyway, I'll be using I. So we're going to introduce this number that is defined to be the number which when you square it, you get minus 1. So in other words, it's more or less saying I is equal to the square root of minus 1. So back to our equation, x squared plus 1 equals 0, which we just found we had x squared equals minus 1. If you have a look here, x must actually be i. Okay? And actually, if we want to be uh, complete, it's i or minus i. Because if you square either of those numbers, uh, i squared, by definition, is minus 1, so it satisfies the equation, and minus i squared is minus 1 squared times i squared, which is 1 times i squared, it's also minus 1. So both of those are solutions to our equation x squared plus 1 equals 0. So already we've introduced this new number i, the imaginary unit, and we've solved an equation with it. We've seen a little bit about how to work with it. Let's just uh, move it on a little tiny bit, basically the same equation. We're going to try to solve the equation x squared plus 9 equals 0. And the important thing here is if x can be an imaginary number. Okay. So normally back before we'd started doing this topic, we would have just said, nah, okay, this is not going to work because we'd get x squared equals minus 9 and then try to take the square root of both sides and get the square root of a negative. But now what I'm going to say is that that means I've got x squared equals 9 times minus 1. So x is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of all that stuff. And that's going to be the square root of 9 just in my working space here, times the square root of minus 1. The square root of 9, of course, is 3. And the square root of minus 1, that's our new number, i. So we've got there plus or minus 3i. So you can actually pull those numbers back, plus 3i and minus 3i, throw them back in the original equation. You'll find that they both work. And they both give you x squared plus 9 equal to 0. So we've got our two solutions. And it's all by bringing in this new number i, the imaginary unit. It's letting us solve these problems that we couldn't solve before. Okay, so that doesn't seem too bad, but it gets a bit more complicated, of course. So let's just jump back for a minute and remember that we have sets of numbers that we've already dealt with. Things like the integers, things like minus 1, minus 2, 7, rationals, things like, um, again, the integers, 1, 2, 3, uh, minus 1 on 2, integers over integers in other words, irrationals like pi, and e and the square root of 2, and real numbers which is essentially you know all of those things uh, 
all of those numbers together, all the numbers in between, on and on. So those are things we're kind of used to seeing. We've now got another set of numbers, which is the ad imaginary numbers. And imaginary numbers are you know, basically just constant multiples of i. So we've already seen uh, plus or minus three times i, plus or minus i. Any of these old numbers up here, integers, rationals, irrationals, multiplied by i, gives us an imaginary number. That allows us to, gr uh, to bring up this new set, a big sort of all-encompassing set called the complex numbers. And they're not called complex because they're hard, they're called complex because they're actually a complex of two pieces. They're made up of uh, real and imaginary numbers, basically, put together. Okay, so it's sums and differences of reals and imaginaries. So something like 1 plus i, that's a real number, plus an imaginary number, 1 minus i, 3 plus the square root of 2i, or minus the square root of 2 plus e times i, whoops, not e to the i, it's a bit more complex, e times i. So those are complex numbers, numbers made up of the sum or difference of real and imaginary numbers. And that's the kind of numbers we're going to be dealing with for the rest of this topic. Now just to give you a bit of a, a thought here, that's only one of the ways that we can write a complex number, where we have the real bit plus the imaginary bit, the i part. And it's got a special name, it's called the Cartesian form. Cartesian because it's, uh, it lends itself to drawing these things on a Cartesian plane. It's also called the rectangular form for the same reason. And basically it's that form is when you write the complex number z is equal to some number x plus some number y times i. And we call that number x the real part of z, and we call the other number y the imaginary part. Now notice we've got this really weird looking symbol here, the r and the i. If I was writing those in, in pen, I don't actually use that weird symbol, I write it like this, r e part of z and i m part of z. It's just a way of denoting the real part and the imaginary part of the number. So that's our Cartesian form. Later we'll be looking at some different ways to represent the complex numbers. So let's just finish it off. Uh, we're going to get some complex number solutions to this quadratic equation that we wouldn't have been able to solve before. But we're going to do it the same way as usual though. So we've got a complex number where a is equal to 1, b is equal to minus 2, and c is equal to 2. So I'm going to say here that x1 and 2 by the quadratic formula is equal to negative b, which is going to be 2, plus or minus the square of negative 2 squared, which is 4. Take away 4 times 1 times 2, which is of course 8, all over 2 times a, 2 times 1 is 2. So we've got 2 plus or, <coughs> plus or minus the square root, square root of minus 4, all over 2. I'm just going to go off in the scribble space again. Square root of minus 4 is the same as the square root of 4 times the square root of minus 1. The square root of 4 is 2. The square root of minus 1, we know that's i. So we've got there, we can replace that now by 2i using our new imaginary unit. So we've got 2 plus or minus 2i all over 2. There's a common factor on the top here, 2 plus 2i. I should just show you. 2 plus 2i over 2. It's 2 outside of 1 plus i over 2, so the 2's cancel. So we've got 1 plus i and also 1 minus i. The 2's cancel for the 1 minus as well. You can just imagine replacing those with minuses. So we've got our two solutions to the quadratic, 1 plus i and 1 minus i. Now at the moment you can't actually check that because you don't really know the rules for arithmetic of these numbers, but after the next video you should be able to do that and you'll see that those values actually do solve that quadratic equation. Anyway, that's how we, we can now solve all those quadratics that we like. Uh, there's no more saying there's no solution because it's a square root of a negative because we've got these new complex numbers and they give us the solutions. So just to finish it off, this is uh, section 3.1, the first part of 3.1 in the Mallet, uh, Pettit and Farr textbook. And of course it'll be the introduction of any complex number section in a, a textbook if you find them. 
uh, check out the exercises from the worksheet um, and also the usual thing write down in your notebook any questions you've got for us that's it for this video